Tiger is one of those vehicles of extremes. It's either the best tank of World War II or, in the immortal words of mechanical genius Moriarty, it's a piece of junk. Now, of course, there are various opinions in between. I happen to have a slightly more nuanced view of Tiger, but that is a little bit of opinion, and, well, let's try to stick with facts as best as possible. And now, a word from our sponsors. More taste, smoother on the throat. Better smoke. Join the Time Ghost Army. Tiger was one of the last tanks that was developed with a little bit of, shall we say, a minimum of political interference, although old Adolf did kind of get involved a little bit in the process. But it actually goes back to a doctrinal requirement before the war. So it, it's a strange concept that when tank designers decide to come up with a tank, they don't just say, what's the biggest gun we can put on? What's the biggest armor we can put on it? What's the most powerful engine? They actually come up with a doctrinal framework in which this tank is supposed to operate. If you look in the 1930s, let's say 1936 or so, at the development process for German armor, you'll see that they had a series of requirements. At the top end of the list of requirements were things like crew size, or the actual verbiage was division of labor within the crew, and radius of action. At the very bottom of the list, I mean, absolutely the last requirement, at least as long as it stopped the 25 millimeter French gun, was armor. And that's how you ended up with the Panzer 1, 2, 3, and 4. But in the late 30s, the Germans decided they needed to have an additional capability which the smaller tanks could not provide. And this would eventually become the Durchbruchswagen, uh, basically a breakthrough tank which in terms of concept would be fairly similar to say the KV. This was a specialty use vehicle, a scalpel designed to operate within a specific framework. It was known this was not going to be a general purpose tank. It was never designed to be. The Durch Bruchswagen ended up going through a couple of evolutions, VK3601 and onwards. And there were two basic splits here. One is from the Porsche Type 100, Type 101, and the other is with the Henschel uh, 45.01. And Porsche was basically first off the line. Now, the, the Henschel design, they were, they were looking at maybe putting the, the Cornish, uh, the 7.5, the super high velocity gun, uh, because one of the requirements for this vehicle was to deal with heavy tanks. So this wasn't just a breakthrough tank in the case of dealing with fortifications and anti-tank guns. This was also designed to go up against the heaviest things that you were going to find, including specifically the Char B1s. So they said about what guns can we have, and they have this tapered gun, the Cornish 7.5, which is a super high velocity gun which required a tungsten ammunition core. Now, of course, tungsten is a rare element, uh, and, well, at least industrially speaking, and there are a lot of other uses that are arguably more important to put tungsten to than shooting it at other tanks. Which incidentally is also why tungsten ammo came uh, late, the HVAP ammo uh, for the Americans as well, because they were using it for other purposes in the war industry. Being as it was a critical item, the German leadership took a look at this Cornish cannon and said, look, here is our set of requirements. It's gotta be able to penetrate this much at this range. If the only thing that can do it is the tungsten cord 7.5 taper gun, then that's what we'll do. But if any other gun can make this requirement, we'll go with that. So they have a little chew on this. Now, Porsche, of course, is famously working on his electric drive transmission Porsche Tiger. And he is so confident that this is gonna work, he goes to Krupp, the turret manufacturer, and says, look, we would like you please to make a turret for this tank. Krupp comes back and says, how do you like an 8.8? .8? Well, we'll like that very much, thank you very much. And so the 8.8 .8 turret was designed by Krupp to mesh with the Porsche Tiger chassis with an electric traverse drive. They're that common. Off goes Porsche, he builds 100 Tigers, and there's 100 turrets of these things. However, in testing, things don't work out all that well. Meanwhile, Henschel is doing okay with its chassis, except the problem is that they decided to go with a hydraulic traverse instead of electric. So then the turret fit though. But then the question was, what is Tiger actually going to be? Because this 8.8 .8 doesn't right now meet 
the penetration requirements that we're looking for. Believe it or not, the, the 8.8 L56 wasn't going to meet those requirements. And so they decided that they also had this new gun being developed, the KWK-42, which eventually would see service with Panther. To fit this, they developed a new turret, looks a bit like the 3601 turret, and the resulting vehicle by Henschel was going to be called the Tiger H House H2. And they only made mock-ups of it, but basically, if you imagine a small turret on a Tiger, big Tiger chassis with a very long 7.5 centimeter gun, that was the Tiger that the Army wanted to build because it met the armor penetration requirements. The small ammunition didn't take up as much space as the 8.8 .8 ammunition, because you know, 7.5 versus 8.8, the smaller you get more ammo. Ammunition supply is an important criterion, especially back in World War II. Tanks were rejected because they didn't carry enough ammunition in the design process. So the thinking was, let's take the Henschel chassis that we know works. We'll take the 100 Krupp turrets for the electric drive, we'll put them onto the Henschel chassis, We'll convert them to hydraulic. Then we'll start building H2s with the 7.5, the long 7.5, and that will be the type. Of course, things didn't work out that way. Uh, they had a bit of a chew on this, and the two things happened. One, a new ammunition development for the 8.8 .8 meant that the 8.8 .8 could meet the required armor penetration characteristics. Secondly, well, sure, in a year they'll be converting to the L71 to put into the Tiger. So it's very inefficient to make 100 8.856s, however many 7.570s, then convert to the 8.871. So all we'll do is we'll just make 8.856s until the 8.871 is fitted to Tiger. Now, of course, that was never added to Tiger 1. We went on to Tiger 2, but that's an entire different story. So that's how you end up with Tiger as it is now. It's almost a happy accident. Now, it's something I'm not gonna tell you about is I'm not gonna tell you that the front slope is 10 degrees at 110 millimeters. I mean, the Germans understood sloped armor, that's why it's sloped at 10 degrees. It's, it's, there are benefits and losses at the time they thought that was enough. I'm not gonna tell you the armor characteristics of the 8.856. I'm not gonna tell you the operational history where it was first used on the Eastern Front or when it was first captured in North Africa, because these are things that you can look up yourself. Google is a thing. But I have long maintained that in order to truly evaluate a vehicle, and I hate it when people ask me, is this tank better than that tank? So I've never even seen one of those tanks, let alone been in it, let alone used it. How do you really evaluate the nuances of a vehicle like Tiger? I've been in it. I've been in Tiger 131, the, the only operating Tiger in England. I've got a, some fair idea. Obviously, I've looked at uh, this one here at the US Army's Armour and Cavalry Collection in Fort Benning, Georgia, which, if you're curious, that's where I am. But to really, really know what the nuances are of a tank, you've got to get into the nuts and bolts. And happily, that's exactly what they've done here. This is Tiger 712, 712 came to the US after capture in North Africa. And of interest, uh, and I always harp on about logistics, there were photographs of this tank arriving in New York Harbor. It had to be shipped in two pieces. The turret was shipped separately to the hull, simply because it made life a lot easier for the cranes. And people say, well, why you could ship this thing overseas, why couldn't you ship heavier American tanks? Well, that's exactly why. If the Americans had to take this thing into two pieces to get it over the water, yeah, can imagine the amount of fun that they would have had getting hundreds or thousands of tanks the other direction shipped in two pieces. But regardless, vehicle comes to the US is used for testing. Eventually, they decide to use it for training because it was the only way apparently that the army was going to pay to keep this thing in any fit condition. So in order to use it for training, you will see they have cut out part of the vehicle. Left-hand side, and they've done that with a few vehicles, King Tiger, the Panzer IV, and so on. Yes, I know, a lot of people are going, ah, you have destroyed the tank. Well, in fairness, if you want to see an intact King Tiger or an intact Tiger One, they're still out there, but you can only see the outside. If you, as the average punter, want to go up and see what life was like inside a tank, well, the only solution is, you stand next to one that has been cut away. 
And so that is actually the purpose, the official purpose of the Armour and Cavalry Collection here is to train new soldiers. It's part of the port, uh, program of instruction. All new recruits have to go through this collection. So they can come up and they can see exactly how thick the side armor was. They can see how far back the gun goes into the, uh, into the breach and so on. Now the catch, this is under a partial restoration. They're not complete with it. They've removed a lot of the components. But unfortunately, the World War II channel kind of wanted the video now, so and not three years from now. So this is the best we're going to do. But because they are removing components and working on the tank, I figured these are some of the best people you're going to find, with the possible exception of the guys in Bovington, to tell you the nuances of this tank. The things that you wouldn't ordinarily think of when you're talking about the maintenance and operation of the tank. So what I'm going to do now, because I'm also the cameraman, is I am going to suddenly cut away and my beautiful face will be replaced by that of Mr. Rob Kogan, who is the curator here at the collection. And he is going to give you some of the observations that they have after having actually worked with a tiger. So looking at our particular tiger one here at Fort Benning, Georgia, a uh, little background info. So this is, as we call it, Tiger 712, it was originally the 31st Tiger I to come off the production line. So it's the only initial production Tiger uh, left in the world. Has a few features that other Tigers don't have that you see in museums today. One of those features being that it still has a pistol port on the back of the turret, so that's kind of interesting. It was originally then sent to North Africa where it served with the 501st Heavy Panzer Battalion and then was captured by Allied Forces May 1943, was, was brought back to the United States as the first Tiger I to actually be tested, evaluated by the U.S. Army at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland. Did that for some time, being used to see, you know, how far could the Tiger go? What was its cross-country capability? Uh, by 1944, records show that the tank was already inoperable, that it had broken down to the point the U.S. Army couldn't repair it. And then in 1945-46, the U.S. Army starts sending all its German equipment essentially to get scrapped or to be used as range targets. Uh, so 1946, this tank as we know it was on the chopping block getting ready to get, it, get its, uh, you know, its, its, its final trip down range, so to speak. Uh, but it gets a stay at execution by uh, Colonel George B. Jarrett, Colonel of the Ordnance Corps, uh, who had actually captured this tank, or I should say recovered this tank in 1943. And it's in 1946 when he says, time out, let me save these pieces, uh, these enemy foreign vehicles that we have. Let me convert them into instructional pieces. And that's when he cuts away the side of the armor on the tank. Uh, and that's why a lot of our German armor today here in the collection do have the sides cut away, but allows us to see inside. And so mid-1950s, there's actually film clips showing uh, American tankers inside these tanks dressed in German uniforms, demonstrating the crew drills, the ergonomics of the vehicle, uh, which is kind of fascinating, uh, kind of sad the vehicle was unfortunately permanently altered this way, but it's also really cool because it allows us to look at these vehicles and actually uh, see kind of this X-ray vision view at it, how they, how their interiors kind of fit with what you see on the outside. Uh, sometime in the 1960s, most of the Aberdeen collection was moved outside, including the Tiger One. It spent, unfortunately, several decades outside, uh, unfortunately degraded a good bit. And then in the late 1980s, it was sent to Europe uh, on loan to uh, some German museums, bounced around Germany for a little bit and other parts of Europe until it finally came back to the United States in 2012. Since that time, it has gone through a very slow restoration uh, the staff is really small here at Fort Benning, so most of the last 10 years this vehicle has been single-handedly worked on by Len Dyer, the director of the Armour and Cavalry Collection. Uh, and then in uh, 2021, as we started moving to our new building here, uh, we quickly realized we wanted to at least get the tank in a position where we could get it moved over into the building, uh, somewhat display-worthy, if not exactly where we want it. And uh, that's when we went ahead, finished removing the last of the, the old Aberdeen Proving Grounds paint. Uh, got it repainted in the raw 8000 color you see here right now, uh, but we're not even halfway done on this vehicle. We haven't touched the interior yet. Uh, the paint scheme is not complete. It will be in what they call the Tropin 1 paint scheme. So you have the raw 8000 base coat, but there will be then a uh, camouflage pattern applied uh, of raw 7008. And that's kind of that dark khaki uh, gray color that you see on North Africa Tigers. And so that's the quick background of this tank. And I'll take you around and show you some of the nuances of the Tiger One design. So first of all, looking at the Tiger One's just general 
overall profile. You notice it's very big and boxy. Uh, there's been some debate about how much the Germans knew about the advantages of sloped armor. Uh, I'm not going to get into that today. I'm just going to look at the Tiger one as it is. Uh, but its outside profile follows very closely with the Panzer III's and Panzer IV's before it. Uh, of course, sloped armor does have protective uh, features to it, but big and boxy like this, uh, the big thing is it allows you to cram lots of things in the tank, like ammunition, uh, radios, uh, secondary you know, storage for, for tools and the crew components. Anything you need can actually go in the tank. Once you start adding sloped angles, stowage starts becoming a little bit of an issue. So there are some advantages to having a big box for a tank design. And that's what one of the uh, key features you see of the Tiger One's hull is it's big and boxy, so it can carry lots of ammunition. Looking here on the front, you can see it has nice big wide tracks. Uh, those wide tracks, of course, give good flotation, especially combined with the interweaving road wheels. Uh, the interweaving road wheels, a lot of times people look at it and they kind of cross their eyes because they can't believe the amount of road wheels you see. But that was important to the Germans because they realized this tank still needed to have decent mobility. So by having all these layers of road wheels, you're going to create uh, increase the flotation of the tank. Whole point being is, yes, even though you have a 50 plus ton vehicle, it's still going to be crossing over softer ground that lighter tanks can go to. And so that was one of the uh, reasons for going with that interweaving road wheels. That does create issues. We had these road wheels off uh, during the last couple of years restoration. Uh, we still had some of the inner layers on, but the outer layers were off. And so when we had to reinstall it, uh, first of all, we had to make sure we were putting the right road wheels on the right stations. Now, for us, that was nuanced because that we knew what road wheels were supposed to go on the stations. They're actually labeled on the inside by Aberdeen Proving Ground. Uh, but it's very, very uh, challenging thinking about working on this vehicle in a field environment. And for some reason, one of your inner road wheels gets damaged. Uh, in some cases, if it's a center road wheel, you might have to take 13 other road wheels off just to get to that road wheel. And you are going to have tools, uh, you know, German maintenance units did have some air compressors in their uh, table of equipment, uh, but at the end of the day, it's going to require a lot of time. It's going to require a lot of manpower in order to switch out road wheels and conduct any maintenance on it. Uh, the tracks themselves are extremely, extremely heavy. Uh, these all steel track designs, uh, just think of the top of my head, uh, we did some calculations before we put the tracks back on last year. Uh, an Abrams track set weighs about 2.5 tons. Tiger One's track set weighs about 3.5 tons. So these tracks actually weigh more than a modern Abrams tank, which actually weighs 20 tons more than this vehicle. Uh, but again, it's big, it's wide, and it's very, very heavy track. And of course, disadvantage of having such a wide footprint as the Tiger One is that now it's no longer going to fit comfortably on rail cars uh, or trucks. And especially with rail cars, of course, with the smaller gauge European rail, rail lines, you have the potential that this now overhangs enough, it could actually cause issues with other trains going past it. Uh, nobody likes a good train collision, especially in the middle of a war. And so the Germans, of course, they're going to develop transportation track, track that is much nearer, actually comes to the sprocket teeth. And so imagine you're, you know, your unit's sent to the front, you're on a train, your train might be getting bombarded, it might be attacked by aircraft. Once you finally make it to, to the railhead you're supposed to get off at, you then have to take off the transportation track, bundle it up, get it stowed away, and then put on this 3.5 tons per set of combat track, as they call it. Uh, not something you really want to do. You might have to be doing this under fire. You, know, you might be getting, be getting harassed. And then you have to go into combat after adding it on. Uh, you know, not, not something really most tankers today would want to do. So as you can see, just looking at the suspension system, with pretty much every advantage you get with these features, you're getting a, a trade-off in return that uh, may not be so good. Uh, I'll take you around now. We're going to start working our way back through the tank, looking at the interior. So now looking at the interior vehicle, working our way from the front to back. Uh, first of all, it's important to note, like I said, we have not done any restoration work on the interior of this vehicle. In fact, most of the interior components are actually still in storage in our parts warehouse. We haven't even really pulled them out yet. We've inventoried them in the last year, but we haven't pulled them out. Going over again, noticing the big boxy shape of the Tiger One, plenty of ammunition storage. So you literally looking at the far side of the hall, you can actually see the ammo lockers that are still there. So you have ammo lockers built into the side of the hall, and then you even have them around the turret ring and even in the floor. So there is space everywhere for ammunition storage. Again, that's great because with these 90 degree angles, that allows you to do that. Looking at the front of the vehicle, uh, one of the things we are missing in here is the transmission for this tank. Uh, that's, like I said, our spare parts warehouse. So the all of our transmission, uh, it was very advanced for its time, very smooth driving. When it worked, it worked great, but could be a bit finicky and required a well-trained driver. 
Big problem with that transmission is in the maintenance of this vehicle. If for some reason you have to remove the transmission, you have to remove the turret, you know, any of the sub turret components are in the way, the driver and radio operator stations, all the radio racks, everything that would be in the center of the front, then you pull out the transmission after you disconnected it from the final drives. Uh, that is not something easy to do in the field. Uh, today we are very spoiled on modern tanks, especially uh, you know, Western tanks, because we use engine transmission pack systems. The whole thing comes out as one component from the back. Uh, because the engine is in the back of the Tiger with its transmission in the front, the issue you run into is that you now have this powertrain going across the bottom of the tank. And that's one reason why the Tiger and a lot of World War II tanks are so tall, is because they have to make space for the drivetrain going through the vehicle. Another issue with the transmission that you're not gonna see on modern tanks is that there's no real way to disconnect the final drives uh, from the transmission very quickly. Pretty much, you have to disconnect the whole transmission. And so, uh, if you're trying to recover this vehicle and for some reason it's stuck in gear, you're going to have issues with that as well. That's going to be fighting you. I mentioned already on the far side of the vehicle, you would have had the radio operator who has a uh, MG34 uh, tank variant that he could use to engage uh, dismount troops or vehicles in front of him. And then of course your driver over here. In between them, you would have though had a wall uh, with the transmission and then the radio sets for the radio operator. Uh, they would not have been able to pass things back and forth very easily amongst each other or communicate. Not like on American tanks where the bow gunner was supposed to be a, an assistant driver. You're not really gonna see that with this vehicle because there's really no way for them to interact. Uh, another interesting, you know, Bit of info is a lot of times, especially people who, whether they're, they're making paintings of the Tiger, drawings, or models of the Tiger one, they always like to show, you know, a lot of times the driver's hatch open, the driver's sticking out, you know, looking all very happy as he's driving his vehicle. Uh, that is very difficult to do on this vehicle because the hatch is actually not center lined on the driver's seat. Both the hatches are actually more over on the sponson or the side of the tank. And so for the driver to actually have his head out, he's actually, up out of his seat, almost kind of rotated to the side with his head out. Uh, not a very comfortable way to drive, and that's one reason why then in front of the driver, you have that big vision block system uh, that he can rotate a knob, it'll open it up for him. Uh, and unlike certain uh, movies, I think it's Saving Private Ryan, where it shows the ability to take out Tiger drivers by shooting through the driver's vision, that vision block system would have had ballistic glass inside. Uh, and so for someone to be able to kill a Tiger driver through his vision slit, uh, you would need a pretty high powered weapon that's probably not even gonna fit through there anyway. So moving up from the hull to the turret, uh, we'll talk probably about the most important feature of the Tiger One, which is the quick 36, 8.8 .8 centimeter main gun. Looking at why this gun becomes so prominent in World War II, really had to look back to the previous war, which is after World War I, the Treaty of Versailles bans the Germans from really producing offensive weapons. But one thing they are allowed to produce as defensive weapons are anti-aircraft guns. And of course, we all know that, you know, Battle of France 1940, the Germans realized that their anti-tank guns at the time aren't that great against the French tanks and even vehicles like the um, uh, British Matilda. There's some issues. And so what we find is the Germans quickly embrace the 88 is going to be uh, their new tank gun mounted on the Tiger One. So really this whole tank starts out all focused on that weapon system. Uh, and it is a very good gun. Uh, I mean, the accuracy on it was fantastic. One big advantage that the gunner has back in his position is the optics. The Zeiss optics that these gunners are using are very good and it's going to give them a very big advantage because it doesn't matter how good your gun is, if you can't see your target and lay your gun on, doesn't matter. Taking a look at the Tiger One gunner position, uh, you're gonna notice that the gunner, unlike most modern Western tank designs today, he's located on the left-hand side of the turret. Uh, same thing for the tank commander. I've heard a couple different theories around this. Uh, one I've heard is that allowed then the, the gunner's sight to be on the right side of the gunner's face. You know, Presumably for most people, their most predominant eye, and that was supposed to give an advantage perhaps in looking. Uh, seems a little strange with the earlier Tiger ones because they used a binocular sight instead of monocular sights, so you're using both eyes anyway. And then the other theory being that that means then all your manual controls are on the right-hand side of the gunner, so he actually will be able to operate them more efficiently. So those are the two theories for that. Uh, not sure how true that is, if it's just a cultural you know, engineering design bit, uh, but you're gonna see on the Sherman tank though, most of the controls are fairly amb ambidextrous in that, so there's some debate about how efficient one setup is over the other. Uh, so your gunner would be sitting there. He did have pedals uh, for firing. 
uh, the main gun. He also had a pedal for firing uh, his coax machine gun. So on the other side of the tank, you would have another MG34 coax machine gun that would be used to engage infantry dismounts and light vehicles like trucks or whatever else that you didn't want to waste a main gun round on. Uh, he would have had his manual controls, which you can see are still in place, but then there was also power controls uh, as well to allow the turret to turn. The turret, uh, at normal power settings, it could take a full minute to do 360 degrees, but because this is a power takeoff traversing system, you could actually get the turret to move faster by having your driver switch to neutral, rev the engine, allow more power taken off the engine through the turret, you could actually get better turning uh, rate on the turret. Uh, that requires a lot of coordination between the crew though to achieve, especially in the chaos of battle, might not always be able to happen. Behind the gunner, you're going to have, of course, the tank commander who runs the entire operation. Uh, as you can see, he has his own manual traversing mechanism, because again, you're a tank commander, he might be spawning targets, he's trying to get the gunner on, so he's gonna take over maybe some of the manual traversing to get the gunner on his target uh, as quickly as possible. On these older Tiger ones, you're going to see they have what some people refer to as the dust bin cupola. Uh, it is very, you know, while it's circular, it's very boxy coming out of the top of the turret, and it's direct vision system, which means that there's no periscopes, really you are looking straight out, uh, protected slits to the, uh, to the outside world. Uh, in fact, in the front of the cupola, there's even a little blade built into the site uh, that is aimed to the front of the tank, the whole point being the tank commander, once he's on point with his uh, aiming point, he knows that the gunner should be able to see the target. Uh, it's not a, a, a bad position to see out of, uh, but there are some disadvantages. Otto Carius himself talks about how they didn't like this design because it requires the tank commander's head to be inside the cupola. Modern tanks with periscopes, you can actually sit down inside the turret, all nice protected, and still see the outside world above you. With this, if an unlucky round happens to hit that cupola, it's going to take the tank commander's head with him. And we actually now know that, uh, you know, American tank destroyer field gun doctrine, this was actually supposed to be the primary target on the Tiger One for some of the anti-tank gun crews was to aim at the cupola. The whole point being, hey, you've taken out the tank commander, you've now hurt that crew's ability uh, to engage other targets. And so that's why later on with later Tiger Ones, you're going to see the same type of cupolas used as on the Panther and the King Tiger, uh, the low profile periscope featuring style. Uh, tank commander also would have had in his cupola, ours actually has it, uh, unfortunately the full system's not there, he would have had a mechanical gear that came down from his cupola and attached in with the rest of the traversing system of the turret. So as the turret turned, there's a ring inside the cupola that rotates around so he can always see what degrees from the front of the vehicle the turret's facing. Again, improving that situational awareness of where do you have your main gun at. Uh, is it over the side, is it over the front? Should be, you know, relatively over the front, but Sometimes things happen, that commander needs the ability to figure out where it is. On the complete other side of the gun is the loader. And that is where you get into some issues uh, with crew ergonomics. So uh, a lot of tanks today, there's space behind the gun breech that if for some reason, you know, in, in battle, if people get injured, something happens, you need crew members to switch positions. So uh, you know, if you go down to a three-man crew on a modern tank, you might have your gunner become the loader. Commander becomes the gunner if he needs to. You can't really do that effectively on this tank because first of all, the gun and its guard goes back through most of the vehicle. You would actually have then a guard around the gun breach that actually is protecting the tank commander from getting his arm in the way. And then on the back of the gun, you would have this uh, metal and canvas basket designed to catch your spent cartridge casings coming from the main gun. All of that combined with the power takeoff that would be going from the middle of the hall up to the turret means that there's a lot of stuff in the way. And if for some reason, somebody needs to get to the loader, the loader needs to get to the other side of the turret, uh, it's not happening anytime soon. And that was one of the issues they had initially uh, with these earlier tires is they have the two pistol ports on the back. They don't have the escape hatch for the loader on the back like you see after the 50th Tiger One's made. And so the loader, the only way you can get out is through the loader's hatch on top. It's relatively small. It's not the easiest thing to pull yourself up out and out of. And of course, you're now exposed to whoever fires come in front. So eventually they add the loader's hatch in the back. It just drops down, the loader can get out very quickly. And that's also nice because it's a little bit easier that if he needs to just open it up, toss out some spent cartridge casings, he has that ability as well. Uh, and so overall, looking at this vehicle, while it's very big on the outside, it's filled up with a lot of stuff on the inside. Most of this space you see here, like I said, is going to be filled with ammunition, over 80 rounds of ammunition. And so again, 
even as tanks have changed shapes and sizes, the space for the crew has almost not changed at all in the last 100 years of tank design. Up here, I'm at the front with the, uh, the final drives and the drive sprocket of the Tiger I. Uh, one thing that's very interesting about our tank in particular is uh, there are actually two type of drive sprockets on this vehicle. Uh, this one is reinforced. The other one lacks this thickened reinforcing uh, along the splines here. Uh, what we think and from what we've read from reports is I guess there was issues initially where you're getting cracking between the, the spokes coming out and where it attaches to the outer ring of the sprocket. And eventually they started reinforcing it. Not sure when that change was done to our Tiger One, if it was done before it shipped to North Africa or whether that happened while it was in country. Up here we have the skirts of the tank. Uh, these would have been here not simply as just mud flaps, but they also would have been important for, especially North Africa, keeping the dust down from the vehicle as it was driving through. These would actually channel the dust back down instead of building up into the face of the tank. Something you definitely don't want to happen if you're driving along, your gunner has to gauge targets, and now he can't see anything because of all the dust in front of him. Uh, and so this is actually an in-theater add-on. These were originally not on the, on the vehicle. Uh, what's very interesting is we actually have two types. Uh, so you notice this one tends to have a little more reinforcing and it's actually angled down more whereas the rest on this side are angled up a little bit. Uh, another fascinating thing, and I'm very keeping with the Germans, each one of these skirts is actually stamped and labeled with the tank serial number and actually what position it goes to on the tank. Another final point I'd like to make about the Tiger One, especially as someone who's actually helped work on this vehicle, is that pretty much every part on it is incredibly heavy. Uh, there's very few pieces on this tank that can be easily replaced by one, only two crew members of the field. Uh, you pretty much need the whole crew to work on it at any point. And uh, you know, just getting the final drives back on was like a two day process. Uh, there's just very little on this vehicle that you could say are quick swapping parts. It is difficult. Uh, in closing, if I was going to summarize the Tiger One, which I hate doing because it is so uh, controversial on whether it's a good tank, a bad tank, I think overall, it's a good design for what it was designed for. I think it has some very good features. I think what hamstrung it uh, was the fact that it was designed for offensive operations, but in a defensive style way that was supposed to be a long range sniper. It was forced into close combat roles. Uh, that hamstrung it. And then the fact that it never really had the, the logistical tail to support it, the, the maintenance required to keep these in combat. At the end of the day, you have the best tank in the world, but if you don't have the supplies, you don't have the spare parts, you don't have the maintenance resources needed to keep it in battle, you're not gonna have it very long. So overall, I do think the Tiger One's a good design, just unfortunately had some uh, disadvantages in keeping it going. Well, there you go. Hope you found it interesting and informative and you learned something there. Now, again, I have my own opinions on Tiger, and in fact, I have a video with you controversial opinion on Tiger, if you want to go check it out. But the short version is, I think this was actually a tank that was well designed. The Germans knew what they wanted to get of it. Uh, the problem was that it failed when it started being used in a role outside of what it was designed to do. So again, breakthrough tank, perform the breakthrough, get pulled back for maintenance, then perform the next breakthrough. In actuality, it turned into the fireman of the Eastern Front and was used outside of doctrine, outside of its design specifications, no wonder it had problems. Was it maintenance intensive? Yes, the Germans knew this. That's why if you look at the organization for a heavy tank battalion, it has an entire maintenance company. Whereas a medium tank battalion only has a maintenance platoon. They knew these things had a lot of man hours required to keep them running, but they were willing to devote that man hours in order to get the capability that they were getting. Of course, mechanic man hours soon became something of a problem for the German army, but that was an after the fact. So again, thank you to the US Army's Armor and Cavalry Collection for letting us come around and giving us a, the quick tour of what they saw of Tiger. So, so I'll talk to you on the next one. Take care. All right. <laughs> or I shouldn't say ambidextrous. He's really not ambidextrous. Blah. Ah. Ah. Oh, one thing I'll talk about is how just generally almost every part of this thing is just big and heavy. He's a... Uh, uh, She's okay! She lives, she's breathing. <laughs>